Good afternoon and welcome back to Axiom Space Mission Control in Houston, Texas. My name is John Rackham, the Crew Systems Deputy Manager here at Axiom Space. Today is flight day eight, and this is our fifth daily update of the Axiom 1 mission currently underway on the International Space Station. AX-1 is the world's first all-private astronaut mission to the ISS, which launched from Kennedy Space Center in Florida on April 8th and docked to the ISS approximately 21 hours later on April 9th. From left to right, this mission is comprised of our pilot, Larry Connor of Dayton, Ohio, Commander Michael Lopez Alegria of the U.S. and Spain, Mission Specialist Mark Pathy of Canada, and Mission Specialist Eitan Stibba of Israel. And over the last six days on station, their schedules have been full of outreach events, steam engagements, technology demonstrations, and research efforts in collaboration with principal investigators on the ground. One of the technology demonstrations that Axiom has helped manage is the Tesseray project, led by Dr. Ariel Ekblaw with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They are making the final preparations today for a demonstration to be conducted over the weekend. Axiom Space's Jennifer Hernandez was able to chat with Dr. Ekblaw earlier today. Here's that conversation. Dr. Ekblaw, it's so good to see you. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. We're so excited to be part of the historic Axiom mission. So about that mission, so you have a project right now on the International Space Station called Tesseray Project. So the AX-1 crew is helping facilitate this technology demonstration over the weekend. What would you like to share with us, both the scope of the project, but also the technology behind Tesseray? Absolutely. I actually brought a few demos with me this morning, this afternoon, so I can show you a little bit about the technology. The grand vision is to work on the future of space architecture. How can we build space stations, future space habitats bigger than the biggest rocket payload fairing that we currently have available? And the way that my research looks at doing this is through autonomous robotic self-assembly, where future tiles will click and snap into place. And the way that we do this we're testing, this is the inside of a tile. We have seven of these on station with X1 right now. They have custom electro-permanent magnets on the edges of the tile that allow these units to come together and dock autonomously. But there's also a lot of sensing and code and algorithmic work happening to let the tiles decide if they've done that accurately and then pulse off if they need to. So that's autonomous assembly and disassembly. That's incredible. And so um, so our AX1 commander, Michael Lopez Alegria, he'll be, you know, facilitating that, working it. Uh, what kind of data will he be uh, collecting? What do you hope to see uh, working through this? He will indeed, and we're so excited to have his time, a veteran astronaut and a leader, a commander of a really historic, fully private mission to ISS. So what he'll be doing for us is calibration first, making sure that the tiles are working as expected. Then we're going to do a free release of multiple tiles at once and see how the dynamics of the system evolve. How do different tiles come together and dock or undock as they need to? They're doing this completely on their own without a human in the loop. And then at the end, we're thrilled to have this opportunity with Axiom to actually do an aisle weight test. So the tiles would be allowed outside of this containment chamber and able to proceed with another type of an experiment, again, for self-assembly and self-disassembly, all supervised by Mike L.A. And, and what do you imagine you'll see in those two different scenarios? What are some of those differences that, um, that, that could be revealed in the, in the project? So part of what we're hoping to see is good first bonding when the tiles actually come together exactly as they're supposed to and form the curvature of what would ultimately be a buckyball. So if we were flying 32 tiles, that would be the goal. We're flying a subset, but we can still see how these tiles are able to succeed or not succeed at forming a part of that shape. The second test would also be looking at error handling. So we expect, because it's a stochastic system, for the tiles to also bond incorrectly, and they need to be able to detect that on their own and correct for it. So we expect to see some bad bonds and some tiles popping off and pulsing away from each other as they self-correct. Really, what are some of the ways that you can see this technology being deployed in the future? 
My vision and long-term goal is for this to be a habitat infrastructure in the future, but we can also see this technology being useful for self-assembling satellites or reconfigurable satellites, and maybe in the future even for parabolic mirrors and for large-scale space telescopes. We're working with hexagon and pentagons, right, for our current uh, AX-1 mission, and these are shapes that are really relevant for lots of different structures in orbit, not just habitats. And so behind you, you have tesserae. And so can you tell us a little bit about what that means? It is a tortured acronym, um, but one that we love. It stands for the Tessellated Electromagnetic Space Structures for the Exploration of Reconfigurable Adaptive Environments. And this is really showing that we're leveraging electro-permanent magnets and self-assembly and self-disassembly to build structures and disassemble them all within the same hardware. That's incredible. And so for viewers out there, how can we learn more about this project and uh, more about the science and the data that, um, so we can follow along? Absolutely. So this was my PhD research. I've since completed my PhD, but it's a really big team behind all of this work as well. As any space flight, you know, payload developer knows it takes a team to be able to get this far. So if viewers would like to learn more, we have a website about Tesserae that you can find more on Axiom's website. I think it's linked to in your mission blog posts. Uh, we also have a YouTube video where you can see an artist's vision of the full concept of Tesserae, how it would self-assemble in an orbit around Mars, for example. That's fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Really exciting work and uh, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. We're looking forward to our mission tomorrow. Oh, well, that was fantastic to see. Um, well, joining me now is Jerry Matthew, one of the Axiom operations lead on this AX1 mission. Jerry, thank you for joining me today. I know you've had a very busy day on console, so thank you for being with us today. Uh, great to be here. Yeah, wonderful to have you. All right, well, before we jump in, tell me a little bit more about your role on this mission. So I'm a Axiom operations lead, okay. so, or, or Axel, and we're basically in charge of the Axiom flight control team that's executing the AX-1 mission. Okay. So we uh, um, make sure that uh, everybody in the team is uh, doing their jobs, we make sure the crew is doing well, and that the, all the signs and research objectives are being met. Great, great, wonderful. So, you know, how does how does that operations team really look, right? We have, you said you the Axiom operations lead. What does the rest of that team kind of look like, high level? And how, and how do they ensure that the mission objectives are achieved? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we uh, have a um, uh, flight control position called Adam. Okay. And basically the Adam takes care of all the timeline uh, um, input and making sure the timeline looks good for the crew members, right? Okay. Every minute of their day is scheduled. And so we want to make sure that their time on station is used efficiently and that Adam flight controller take make sure that that happens. Okay. Um, we also have a flight control position called Axis, and they're the stowage officer. And so they, may see, they make sure that all the stowage that comes up on, on Crew Dragon gets put into the right location on ISS, that we keep track of all of that. And then when the crew is ready to depart, they gather all the items together, put it back on Dragon, make sure everything is um, analyzed and okay. sent over to SpaceX and coordinated with SpaceX and then uh, it would be ready for us to return. Okay. And then we also have um, the um, Aero Console, which is the Axiom Research Officer, and they're in charge of all the payload operations on oh. uh, during the AX-1 mission. Okay, so they're pretty busy this mission. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because of the large number of uh, payloads that the crew has uh, yeah. um, willingly supported, for their mission, there's a lot for them to do. And they have a very important job to make sure that they coordinate between NASA ISIS flight controller team, as well as a POIC, which is the a payload operations center out our Marshall Space Flight Center, who is in charge of all payload operations on ISS. And then um, coordinating with those real-time teams and then coordinating with the actual uh, researchers, right? Okay. And the, the, uh, the payload investigators who okay. want this um, uh, science conducted on right. the ISS. Right. And making sure that this is all in line with what the AX-1 crew wants to do and the science that they are interested in and want to accomplish on ISS. Okay. And then finally, we have our uh, medical operations team, right. uh, which includes the Axiom BME, biomedical engineer, mm -hmm. as well as the Axiom uh, flight surgeons. Okay. And their main purpose is to make sure the crew is healthy, they're happy, they're, they're uh, comfortable on ISS, right. that they're not dealing in with any kind of issues, and uh, that uh, overall the crew is doing well while they're on the ISS itself. Okay, excellent. So we're, you know, we're looking for things like crew health, so they're effective and you know, obviously enjoying their stay, um, but being efficient. And then things like managing the timeline, yep. um, managing stowage, yep. and obviously managing the 
vast amount of research that crew is undertaking for this mission. All those things have to kind of be in place yep. and handled from the ground heavily uh, yep. to ensure that crew and the mission objectives are really achieved. Absolutely. Excellent, excellent. So, you know, we talked a little bit about how busy they are up there. What, what were some of the key highlights from today, flight day eight? What were some of the main highlights that you guys took away today? So I think a couple of highlights today was, uh, one was uh, the Dano ISS antenna, okay. uh, which is basically this um, flexible um, antenna that it can deploy and be uh, uh, put back together. Very cool. Yeah, and so the, the crew did that in a microgravity environment, right. and then they took a bunch of pictures to make sure that uh, everything looks correct, that yeah. it deployed correctly, and that it can also be um, uh, folded back cor oh, really? correctly as well. Excellent, yeah. so repackaged yeah. too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. And then the other part is the Astrorad uh, vest that the cr crew wore. Yeah. yeah, and so basically what they do is uh, they put on this radiation vest, yeah. and uh, it helps them protect against radiation strikes, right? Especially as uh, we are in the future going to go past low Earth orbit, right. there's a lot of radiation in, in outer space. Right. And we want to make sure our crew is protected. And so this, uh, the vest itself um, helps protect the crew in mm -hmm. that instance. And then it also monitors uh, uh, to, uh, uh, different data pad different data to make sure that uh, the crew is healthy. Okay. And then the crew is also trying to get a feel for how it, uh, how they can move around, how flexible it is, how, how comfortable it yeah. is to wear for extended periods of time. Yeah. And to make sure that uh, everything is good in, in that regard. Nice. Yeah. yeah, you know, these two these two particular payloads, I think, to me, are, are really interesting from not just the AX-1 mission standpoint or from a science standpoint, but also, you know, from the Axiom's other efforts in developing HAB-1 and other modules, right? We need to learn how to you know, utilize small form factor, deployable and, and repackageable things like communication devices, um, but also particularly the radiation aspect. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned as we leave low Earth orbit, um, you know, we, we, we encounter more radiation, but we still have radiation concerns in low Earth orbit yeah. and getting a better understanding of that through, you know, payloads like AstroRed um, really kind of help us get a really good data point for where we need to focus for um, HAB-1. Yeah, absolutely. This all this research that the X One crew is do doing is very relevant to um, future operations, especially for our module as well. That's excellent. Yeah, awesome. So you know that's that. Those are good highlights from today. And as I mentioned, it's flight day eight out of a ten day mission. So crew is you know in the final sprints. What does the next few, what what do the next few days look like for crew from an operations standpoint? What are you guys getting ready for? So um, basically, you know the we're going into the weekend, but the crew itself they're they're not actually taking any time off. They're, they're going to be... That's right, um, it's a holiday weekend. And yeah, and they are fully uh, invested in their research and yeah. all the media outreach, and so they're, they're working hard. You know, yeah. they only have eight days on ISS, so they want to make sure they utilize it well. Right. And so they've uh, they still got a full day at, uh, or full weekend ahead of yeah. them, and uh, they'll be conducting more experiments and doing a lot more media outreach, and the ground team will be there supporting fully as well. Excellent, excellent. So, yeah, so we mentioned, you know, them next week having their return to Earth. So next week we're looking at a return. Right now the timeline the timeline shows undocking is no earlier than Tuesday, April 19th right. at 10.35 a.m. Eastern Time uh, with a splashdown off the coast of Florida uh, on Wednesday, April 20th, no earlier than 7.19 a.m. Eastern Time. So, you know, how is the ops team working really to achieve those next two major milestones for crew? What, like, what is the ops team up to so those objectives? Well, um, the ops team primarily, once we um, start, you know, um, um, getting finished up with all the experiments and stuff like okay. that, we'll focus a lot on the stowage aspect of it, right? Okay. We want to make sure exactly. Okay. We want to make sure that everything that was brought up on on, on uh, Crew Dragon is returned, right? right? And also, we're going to be helping NASA take some um, items back, oh. uh, bring them back to Earth. Oh, wonderful! And so we want to make sure everything is packed uh, in correctly that. Uh, we pass that information on to ISS, right. that is coordinated with the ISS team, okay. as well as SpaceX to make sure that they do all their CG analysis, right. make sure the crew, the crew Dragon is good to go. Right, everything's going to be packed in a very specific place to ensure you know proper reentry profiles and um, just proper vehicle operations on the way home. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Okay, excellent. So, you know, let's talk through some of the variables that might impact a, um, a, a return home. Like, what kind of things are we looking out for to ensure that, you know, we achieve those timelines of, a, of an undock and a splashdown? What kind of variables are we looking at? Weather, uh, vehicle status? Yep, and so weather is a huge part of it. And okay. so a lot of the analysis has already been complete. And so, um, you know, the ISS has a lot of vehicle traffic. You yeah. know, there's a lot of people going up and down, a lot of um, crew members going up and down, a lot of um, cargo that's coming right. up and down. 
And so, you know, we have our window and we're trying to make sure that we get up to the ISS and then come return back at, at, the, at the right time. Right. And we don't want right. to hold anyone else up right. from getting there. So a lot of the analysis has been done to get us to fit in this t timeline. And that's how we came up with the, um, uh, the 419 date. Okay. And it was very closely coordinated with ISS and, and SpaceX. Right. And we're all on the same page on right. when to come back. And now the big factor is weather. Okay. You know, and so on, on the 419 undock date for the splashdown, there's you know a couple of opportunities there okay. to make sure that we're not just dependent on one splashdown time. Cause, because for um, um, the crew to be safely recovered from their vehicle and brought back to shore, we have to make sure the weather at the uh, splashdown location is good to go, right? And okay. so um, that's something that we'll be monitoring closely along with SpaceX to make sure that uh, it's a good environment and then um, we'll uh, use those opportunities to, to come back. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, you know, as, as this has been a, um, you know, major first for spaceflight, uh, it's been a major first for uh, the International Space Station program, and obviously one for Axiom. Um, so in the sense of that, how, how, what, what is the ops team, you know, doing moving forward? Um, how are they using this first to kind of better understand where do we take our procedures next? How do we understand how we operate, you know, missions like AX2 and beyond? Um, what 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 kind of you know maybe immediate debrief points are we looking at uh, from this mission, you know, to better ourselves for next time? Yeah, that's, that's a that's a great question. So uh, we have a lot of lessons learned from this mission, right? Excellent. And so the, part of the part of the, the the nature of being a historic mission is that no one else has ever done it before, right? right. So we kind of made some assumptions and we, you know, made our plans as best as we can and, and we executed the mission. Yeah. And uh, we'll hopefully finish executing it, uh, you know, sometime next week. And so from that, we at least have uh, a starting point, right? And right. we have a data set. And so we're going to um, look at that, analyze it. And, you know, we have already now a lot of lessons learned that we have figured out, right? And, and part of that, that lessons learned is uh, one of the things we identified is that maybe we don't... Um, have the right uh, positions, or maybe we don't okay. have the uh, the right uh, loading on the different positions, okay. right? And so uh, we might change around the kind of flight controller support we have, where they they are the subject matter experts in, right. you know, and making sure that it is um, um, sent or, or uh, is loaded correctly, so that no one is overwhelmed or no one is doesn't have enough work Copy. to do. And okay. so. That's one of the lessons. The other one is to manage the the, the crew's time and how to right. schedule things on their on their timeline and making sure that uh, it is done in a manner that they can execute efficiently and that they will enjoy their time on ISS. Excellent, excellent. Those are some wonderful lessons learned. And you know, I think moving forward, um, it, it'll just be really important to kind of understand. You know, that this is what we got out of AX1 immediately, and we're going to be able to immediately apply it to better understand mission mission planning mission execution and ultimately mission success. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we learned a lot of things and we're really excited to uh, apply those lessons learned for X2. Wonderful. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I know you've had, again, a long day. you got a few more uh, on your plate, but thank you very much. So we yeah. appreciate you having here. Great to be here. Excellent. Well, thank you to uh, all of you for watching. Uh, today is our final daily update in this format on the X1 mission. We do expect to have plenty of additional information and visuals to share with you over the coming days as more imagery gets downloaded from the ISS. We will share those on our social media channels as well as our blog at axiomspace.com. When the crew's time on station comes to a close this next week, we will mark it with a farewell ceremony and we will watch as the crew boards Dragon and the hatches are closed. We will then have a joint webcast with NASA and SpaceX showing the crew undocking from the station and carry that coverage through their departure beyond the protected zone around the ISS. Then, on Wednesday, April 20th, SpaceX and Axiom will have a joint webcast that begins about an hour prior to splashdown, and we will carry the coverage live through recovery and cruise egress out of Dragon. So stay tuned for updated timings of these events over the coming days on AxiomSpace.com. Otherwise, thanks again for joining. I'm John Rackham, wishing the crew of AX1 a successful conclusion to their time on station and safe travels home next week.